meeting of the Town of Yarmouth Board of Selectmen, if we could please begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. All right, first is the public portion of the meeting, and I'll save the uh, new fire guys till the end of the public portion, and we'll start with... Um, Yes, Andrea. Before um, Andrea St. Germain, um, DY School Committee, and uh, before I do anything else, I just wanted to extend a happy Thanksgiving to everyone, because if I don't do it now, I'll forget it at the end. Um, what you have before you, I've given each of the um, select men and women a copy of our conference that we went to. Uh, last year, every... A uh, school committee member went. This year, uh, six out of seven could go. And uh, the nice thing about this conference, it's annually held here in Hyannis, which is great for us because we can all go. Um, uh, but I thought you'd like to see it and see what happens. And I think, in my estimation, there's probably at least a thousand people there, from school committee members to superintendents, because it's a joint conference. And I put a little green um, uh, tag there, a little paper clip, for you to see something that I thought you should see that it, I thought it was really special. Um, unfortunately, I was the only school committee member that attended this, con this particular workshop, and uh, Carol Woodbury, our, our superintendent, held it, along with um, Kenneth Jenks. And two other people, one of them, Michael Fitzpatrick from Blackstone Regional Valley, and uh, Donna Soraka, which you can see the names there. And to my surprise, I knew we had STEM in our school. That, it's awesome. And it's a, a science, technology, engineering, and math. And if Mr. Jenks was here, he would say, and arts too, because that's a very important part of it. So he always calls it STEAM. But the thing that I thought was so wonderful is there were so many people there to listen to it and got up and asked our people questions, so much so that I couldn't even get up to congratulate them. But we are the first school in Massachusetts to have global STEM. And I think that it, it might be something that we should think about how great that is. Uh, it's giving our students the opportunity to do jobs that look at jobs that will be open in the future. It's uh, all the pieces of innovation and placed in a global STEM. And we're partners with students from other countries sharing and learning with each other new ideas. At this point in time, we're partnering with Russia, France, and the United Kingdom and that we are also looking at partnering with China. And because you know there's a huge time difference and our kids get to school very early in the morning at the high school, they have to get up even earlier to get there to go on global Skype to talk with these students from other schools and in other areas. And they're doing things like water quality, building cities, learning about pollution and ways to prevent it and just looking at how things will change and what they can do to make it change. Um, and they started out with a quote from Thomas Edison who said, chance favors the prepared mind. Carol said something that I thought was unique, that we are preparing our students for the future, not for our past. And sometimes if you think about your own education and sometimes they send out questionnaires, did we really help you with what's going on right now in your education. And sometimes you really have to look back at it and say, well, did you? But we are, and I think we should be very, very proud of what's happening at DY. Um, they're looking at the international job market, and um, let's see, what else did I have to say? Oh, uh, the thing about the kids being very passionate about coming in. They're motivated learners, and Mr. Jenks says, they all arrive early, and they, they utilize the go-to-meeting also. And he said they're so passionate that you can't stop them from learning. 
I'd like to also tell you that what happened last night at the school committee, we recognized Cleon Turner, who is, uh, as you know, is no longer going to be, uh, well, was not running. He hadn't run. But he had, um, he was also, and I didn't realize this, he was a selectman in the town of Dennis for nine years. And we saluted him with a plaque. And it was, and also uh, he was given something by Representative Man Manuel, who was there, had um, a citation. Well, actually, it was um, a resolution signed by the House for the re uh, by a regional because he has done so much for education. We we invited him to our school committee meeting, and without him, we wouldn't have come so far. He started a regional caucus. Uh, so that the needs of regional schools could be heard. Um, and the other thing that I thought you would, should like, would like to know is that, uh, that we're starting just talking about this. It's already happened in Nauset, and we're starting a, maybe a community forum might be starting like in January or February, talking about a later start time for the high school, especially because all the statistics have been coming out, and they've been out for years, but it's more prolific right now, where later start times is more beneficial not only to the mental health, educational health, just general health students because adolescents, pardon me? And parent health, too. <laughs> <laughs> you got a good point. You got a good point there. The other thing that I thought was something. There are so many things worth mentioning, but uh, if you could take put this in your mind, what they're doing at Station Avenue Elementary School is they're building a food pyramid with food for the food bank for 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 people who are in need. And each day's kids bring food in, and they're just watching this little tower grow. And I thought that was meritorious. And I think, I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Oh, uh, networking with schools, other schools in Massachusetts. And that's the last thing I wanted to say. Uh, John Poole, who is the uh, co uh, vice chair for the school committee, brought up a very important point. He said, so many times when we caucus with other people and we meet with other people from all over Massachusetts, they would say, oh, you, you, did th you do this? You have all-day kindergarten? Oh, you have the STEM program? Oh, you have tools in the mind? Oh, you have this, you have that? And we were at one meeting talking about PARC and MCAS, and I was just so surprised to hear how many schools do not have access of an iPad, and our students do and how wonderful that was to hear and listen to, you know, how much further we have come along in our district. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, people think we're the Farm League, we're way out here on the Cape, but we're, we're doing tremendous and wonderful things. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Andrew. Um, when I had put the fire department announcements at the end of public, I didn't consider the fact that we've got at least five little ones sitting here. Do you think they'll last another 10 minutes? My intention is to go into the rest of the meeting on a good note because things don't generally go all that well during the public portion. So I want to save you guys for the end. Um, Michelle, yes. Thank you. I'm Michelle Conover. Uh, recently, I learned that the bus that was often parked on the end of my road at the playground on the beach uh, belonged to that of a level three registered sex offender, uh, thanks to our wonderfully proactive police department that keeps us updated on Facebook. Uh, as a concerned citizen, I called my local police department because I was certain that this wasn't allowable, <laughs> as um, most people I find out assume as well. I learned that there was no local or state uh, laws on the books that restrict um, the movement of sex offenders uh, in our community. And I confirmed this, uh, you know, with the uh, sex offender board. Uh, and that's when I learned that each town in Massachusetts has the right to create bylaws that can, uh, you know, restrict certain things. Uh, and many towns in Massachusetts have adapted bylaws that restrict the residency and movement of level uh, two and three sex offenders. 
Uh, I contacted local state reps, uh, the local attorney general's office, uh, local police chiefs in uh, Massachusetts who have recently uh, had these bylaws enacted in their towns. I spoke with lead researchers. Um, I researched uh, decisions by the attorney general, and I read various organizational position papers on uh, residency restrictions and uh, safe zones. Uh, what I learned was that uh, the Attorney General has ruled that the bylaws created by other towns are not in conflict with mass law. They were signed off on. And I learned that Massachusetts also has a statute that allows the breaking of town bylaws to be an arrestable offense. I learned that bylaws can allow police to uh, safely take action against sex offenders who are loitering in areas where they can cultivate relationships uh, with those they prey upon. And I learned that many of those who treat sex offenders uh, believe that the creation of safe zones can be very helpful in reducing the risk to the public. So the information that I gathered has led me to believe that the, adapta uh, that the adaptation of a bylaw that restricts the movement of level two and three sex offenders by the creation of a child and elderly safe zone is necessary. Uh, you know, when I spoke to one of the local police chiefs in Westwood, he shared with me about a time uh, when he was on the New Bedford force and a level three registered sex offender lured a child away from his mother in a public library and raped him. If a bylaw like that can deter uh, this type of behavior and can enable our police to effectively do their jobs, uh, we have no choice but to adopt one. Uh, my next steps include finalizing the language uh, of the proposed uh, bylaw, getting signatures from registered voters, and submitting the request for a special article to the town clerk. Great. Thank you very much. Yes, Vita. I'll be very uh, short. Uh, I don't know whether any of you uh, has heard uh, the uh, uh, advertisement or commercial on radio uh, for the uh, DY district, I guess. Uh, I was struck by the uh, uh, lineup of uh, why DY is so great. It's great for arts, music, athletics, service clubs, academics. <laughs> I think it, it kind of accurately describes what goes on there these days. Academics seems to come last. Uh, and uh, what uh, uh, Andrea mentioned a little while ago, something about not being in the past. Well, we know, I think, that uh, unless we know our past, we are very often condemned to repeat it. Thank you, Bill. Yes, sir. Good evening, thank you. I'll make this real quick. Tom Nicanello, uh, Bass River, in the wonderful town of Yarmouth. Uh, I'm here as a representative of the Chamber of Commerce, newly elected uh, board member uh, with Linda Jean to make sure that the partnership uh, remains strong with the Chamber. And uh, just to give a quick update, the beginning of the month we had our Taste of Yarmouth, our first ever trolley tour, and it was a sold out. It was a great event, and uh, hopefully we'll do it again next year. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Jack? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Jack McCormick, the Yarmouth representative of the Cape Cod Commission. Just a brief update on what's going on with the uh, DCPC fertilizer, uh, DCPC that uh, is in order to control fertilizer. Just in background, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts decided to enact regulations for fertilizer control in order to establish standards for safe drinking water and comply with the Federal Clean Water Act. Said regulations were to be in place by January 2014, as yet they are only in draft form and have not been enacted. As you know, the Cape Cod Commission established a DCPC for fertilizer control. It was based on the Cape Cod Commission having sought and obtained a nomination as the authority to promulgate said regulations for Cape Cod. The Commission decided to provide a model, a model bylaw for towns to adopt as consistent uh, for their fertilizer control. If a town wrote a bylaw <coughs> that the Commission deemed consistent with the model bylaw, they would so rule and that bylaw would be accepted as exempting the town from future state regulation. The DCPC has a deadline of January 2014, it was extended one year <clears throat> to January 2015. Thus far, the only uh, town so far is Mashpee. They have enacted a bylaw which we accepted as consistent with the model bylaw last Thursday. It is anticipated that other towns, <clears throat> excuse me, will be before the commission in, in our remaining two regular meetings in December. Those towns that chose not to have their own regulations will be subject 
to the state regulations when enacted. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And finally, Chief. Thank you for having us here. Um, Acting Deputy Chief John Sawyer and Acting Chief Phil Simonian. Um, we'd like to uh, bring your attention to the accomplishments of three firefighters who graduated recently from the Massachusetts Fire Academy. We'd also like to take a minute of your time to recognize a uh, recent promotion of uh, John Harbor to Lieutenant. Just like to read a little, uh, a brief thing about the Massachusetts Fire Academy. Today's firefighters do far, mo far more than fight fires. They are the first ones called to respond to chemical and environmental emergencies ranging from suspected carbon monoxide or a gas leak. They may be called to rescue a child who has fallen through the ice or who has locked himself in a bathroom. They rescue people from stalled elevators and those who are trapped in crashed vehicles. They test and maintain their equipment including self-contained breathing apparatus, hydrants, hoses, power tools, and apparatus. At the Massachusetts Fire Academy, they learn all these skills and more from certified fire instructors who are also experienced firefighters. Students learn all the basic skills they need to respond to fires and to contain and control them. They are also given training in public fire education, hazardous materials incident mitigation, flammable liquids, stress management, confined space rescue technique, and repelling. This intensive nine-week training program involves classroom instruction, physical fitness training, firefighter skills training, and live fire practice. Students receive classroom training in all basic firefighter skills. They practice first under non-fire conditions and then during controlled burn situations. To graduate, students must demonstrate proficiency in life safety, search and rescue, ladder operations, water supply, pump operations, and fire attack. Fire attack operations range from very small fires to multiple room, multiple floor structures. Upon successful completion of the recruit program, all students have met national standards of the National Fire Protection Association 1001 and are certified to the level of Firefighter 1 and 2 and has its materials first responder operational level by the Massachusetts Fire Training Council, which is an accredited national board on the fire service professional qualifications. The fire chief will now introduce the three firefighters. Good evening. Thank you very much again for your time. I really appreciate it. I'd like to introduce the following uh, three new firefighter paramedics. Uh, Bill Carter, to my immediate left. Bill was hired in January. He was on our Yarmouth uh, call fire department. Uh, he's a native Cape Carter. He's married to his wife, Liz, and his two sons, Wyatt and Oscar. Uh, Bill was awarded the Outstanding Recruit Award for the high class average with the least amount of deficiencies at the Mass Fire Academy, which was a great honor, and it's a, a great honor for Yarmouth, and uh, we're very proud of that. Next to him is uh, Firefighter Paramedic Michael Perry. Mike was hired in March from Cape Cod. He's recently married to Nicole. Mike was a call firefighter for the town of West Barnstable, and we're very happy to have him on board. And next is uh, firefighter paramedic David Caruso. David was hired in October of last year. He's a Yarmouth native. His father was a captain on the fire department here for several years, Michael Caruso. He retired after 35 years of service to the town of Yarmouth. David's brother, who was also on our call fire department, is now a uh, Dennis Fire Department paramedic. And David also was on the Yarmouth Call Fire Department for five years prior to getting hired full-time. All three did exceptionally well in the Fire Academy, and uh, we're very proud uh, to introduce them to you and your new uh, paramedics. <clears throat> yep. And I'd like to introduce... Uh, Lieutenant John Harbor. John was promoted in July with the retirement of Bob Kittler, who had 40 years on the Yarmouth Fire Department. And he's got some huge shoes to fill, but he knows that, and he's doing a great job. He's married to his wife, Tammy, and he has three sons, Johnny, Nikki, and Brady. And uh, all three are uh, probably going to be professional hockey players or uh, firefighters, one or the other. They're all great athletes. 
Lieutenant Harbor. We're just going to take a moment now, and um, the town clerk, Phil Gaudet, is going to do a swearing-in ceremony, and, and uh, the family can pin the individuals. Thank you, Phil. Sure. All right, gentlemen. All right, gentlemen, if you want to raise your right hands. Tammy. Tammy. Oh. So, come, come up here. Yeah. Liz, you can, you can come over, too, if you want. <laughs> Chief, is the mustache a prerequisite? That's, I was thinking a month. <laughs> is it a November thing? Uh. <laughs> yes. All right, gentlemen. If you want to raise your right hands and repeat after me, I swear, I swear. that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties to which I have been appointed. And abide, and abide by the bylaw, by the laws. I'm sorry, by the bylaws. of the town of Yarmouth and the common, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So help me God. You're all set. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do you guys want to give me or want me to give you 30 seconds to kind of sneak out and then we'll continue? Thank you. Your boys are adorable and they're very well behaved. <laughs> John was my CCD student last year. Wow. <laughs> this is awesome. He's a politician already. <laughs> All right, our, our 715 item was due to be a discussion with the superintendent of schools, Carol Woodbury, on uh, MCAS scores and such. Uh, before the meeting, she informed me that um, she hadn't realized until today that we had only allocated 15 minutes on the agenda for her. And while these times are generally pretty flexible, um, she informed me that her presentation alone was 45 minutes, and that was without any interaction with the board after the fact. So uh, we, uh, had a, we agreed to um, postpone it till um, one of our December meetings, either in, uh, on the 2nd or on the 16th. And uh, we'll be able to give it the attention that it deserves at that time. So um, we look forward to seeing that in a couple weeks. Next on the agenda was uh, the continuation of the second hearing of two public hearings. Both are actually advertised as one, I do believe, uh, from last time. They are on the LaRusso Lodge rental fee hearing and the cemetery fee hearing. And for that, we have Pat Armstrong here to um, fill us in. We're, we're still open from the, last, from the first hearing. So take it away, Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I return to you this evening um, after our first fee hearing to discuss proposed fees for both the LaRusso Lodge at Flax Pond and the cemetery division, I will separate um, those two into two groups, first LaRusso Lodge and secondarily the, uh, the cemeteries. Um, at the last meeting that I came before you, um, I presented a, a slideshow that uh, showed the um, history of, of Flax and the new fees for the new building to pay for the new costs. And um, our hope is to cover our operating and maintenance costs um, to operate this facility and not to go beyond that. So with that, I proposed a, a list of fees, and um, you asked me if I would come back and um, bring a, a concept of a, um, a group fee, so uh, I've put this together for you um, that shows a, 
a group fee with a range. In the past, you um, have um, allowed my allowed me to um, negotiate with different groups depending on their size, the percentage of Yarmouth residents that participate with them, uh, and also um, their profit and nonprofit status. And you've allowed me some flexibility to negotiate some fees. So what I present to you tonight is a range, a base range, and a top range and hope that you will again extend the courtesy of allowing me to negotiate so I can best fit the needs of the community. Um, I already had two people who have come to us looking to rent the hall, one for Thanksgiving dinner, and they're hoping that tonight's fees go well so that they can uh, have their family Thanksgiving dinner at the Lodge at Flax Pond. And I know that there's definitely interest, so I'd like to be able to um, answer all of your concerns and questions tonight so that the fees can be established, knowing that um, we will do our best to um, make sure that it's accessible to as many people in our community as possible. At this point, um, I could review the fees as they've been presented previously, or we could, uh, whatever your pleasure is, Mr. Chairman. I, um, were there any changes to the one, two, three, four, five charts? I see the addition of the, of the group groups that we asked for. Party themes, yes. I, I made no other changes at this point, Mr. Chairman. Does anybody on the board have any questions for Pat, Norm, no. Jim, no. Tracy? I just, uh, was there any uh, correspondence at all that was received since our last hearing? I didn't see any in the Either packet. verbal or otherwise? No. no. In regards to these fees, no. Only that which I sent you about these fees. Mike, anything I additional? <clears throat> yeah, Pat, <clears throat> on this um, up to um, concept of the um, fees being based on the number of participants with ranges of 75 to 275 and then 75 to 350. Um, how do you anticipate making the differentiation as to what groups are going to be charged what amount of money? You mentioned um, taking into account the profit or nonprofit status, and I'm just wondering how stringent or how relaxed you are in terms of your consideration of those of those concepts nonprofit status is a very interesting dynamic people claim they're nonprofit because they feel they make no money but that doesn't mean that they have an 04 number and they're registered with the secretary of state as being a nonprofit entity because it's a group say um well, girl scouts wouldn't be a good example but um, let's say it's the um, book club from one of the local churches. I would consider those. That I'm group. sorry, Pat. Could you stop? If you guys want, I've, I've been listening to it for ten minutes, and I've been growing increasingly aggravated. Please take it outside or stop. Okay. Thank sorry. you. Sorry, Pat. Not a problem. So if it's a group that I know is a social group, but maybe doesn't have an, a pro, uh, an official nonprofit status, and their purpose is to meet. To, as a social group with that kind of interest, I would certainly fit them into that category. So again, um, a cribbage club that's needing a bigger space, or a, a book club, or maybe a, a group of um, women that do Swedish weaving that can't do it at the senior center where they do it now, or men that do Swedish weaving, let me not discriminate. But that's the sort of thing. So that's the flexibility I would have. Also, if um, it was a, a, a group of moms that wanted to do a preschool gathering for their children and there wasn't an impact because they weren't serving food so I wasn't going to have to deal with maintenance afterwards of cleaning up and washing floors and breaking down a lot of tables and have a staff impact, then we could be flexible with that kind of, of funding. As we've done, um, a number of groups have come to use fields and the impact was not significant. So our flexibility, if it's a brand new program, let's say flag football. Two years ago, a group wanted to start a flag football league. They weren't looking to make money. They just wanted to start. We didn't need to paint the lines. We didn't have to do anything extra. The bathrooms were already open. So I reduced their rate so that they could recruit new players and not have to charge full price so that they could establish their program, knowing that in a couple of years as they became established, they'd go up into the regular rate. Um, category. Those are the kinds of things that we've done. To okay, so you're not looking in terms of any formal organization like Eric used the example last time if, if somebody had like a birthday party or a group of children they wanted to have an event they wouldn't have to be organized in any formal or technical way they would be considered more of a nonprofit 
Exactly. Okay, good. Thank you. If there's no other comments, would anybody like to make the motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstained? Passes unanimously. Would anybody care to make a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? <laughs> we're we're moving to pass the fees as presented to yeah, us. Right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? All of the, All of the fees All based of the on the fees. charts with the addition of the theme party three hour classification. Okay. Uh, was there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed to abstain? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Does that include the cemetery or do uh, we need to That did not include no. the cemetery. <laughs> 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 nice yeah, try, could, though. We could always hope. Um, <laughs> it could have if we hadn't clarified Jim's motion. So I bring before you tonight again a group of fees for the cemetery, and as a part of that discussion, again, these fees are for new, new services, are, are new um, amenities that we have not charged for previously. Um, these new services are the retrievable non-biodegradable cremation vault because we are now um, having requests to bury um, loved ones who have been cremated in lots that are anticipated to take a full body burial and we have to disinter those remains in order to bury the full body and then reinter them. So these non-biodegradable cremation vaults are um, an important uh, aspect of our our overall operation, um, the administration fee, which uh, we've talked about with the hopes of not having to do a lot of administration, and then the memorial garden um, bricks, both um, 12 by 12 and 6 by 4. And then along with this, we have um, an impact fee designed to control work in the cemeteries of a monument markout and permit order for $25. Uh, Mike, any questions on this? I think this is exactly the same as we saw the first time. It correct? is. I have no questions, though. Tracy? Same question. Do we have any correspondence or feedback from anybody since our first hearing? Not to me. No. Jim? No questions. I'd just say that uh, these are realistic fees, and they, they do make a difference. And if it brings people to the services and that we can cover them, I, I think it's fine. Norman? None. No. Anybody would like to make a motion to do close we, the... Do you have to go to the... Oh, do I, uh, you're right. Anybody in the public that would see how the, uh, the public hearing is still open that would like to speak in favor or against the public hearings? All right. I'll move to close the hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Make a motion to uh, approve the fees as um, su supplied here. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, Pat. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, support. You. Seeing as we're moving right along, can I ask you one question? Sure. Off topic. Pat, you were here some time back, and we talked about um, updating and amending some of the um, beach policies and rules. Do we know? Yeah, we talked about some of those. a year and a half ago. Yeah. I know we, we talked about recently in the cemetery, and we haven't had a chance to move on much of that. Um, if, could you, uh, I apologize, was it um, we talked about, dogs? We talked about dogs, we talked yeah. about skateboarding. alcohol, skateboard, just random things you were going to revisit. I just didn't know. I know you're busy, but I didn't, know I didn't it bring time. it. I knew that, that you have um, a busy agenda with budgets and the like, but if you would like me to bring that back, I'm ready to bring back a number. Now, especially we were waiting until the... Uh, the pet waste bylaw had been passed before we could address the dog issue. I know we've talked about some fees on the beach that um, you agreed and didn't agree for some things to change. Um, and well, now we could go what back. The process was if the rec commission was going to have some hearings or have the discussion first, and then, but I'd like to see it at some point in yeah. time be addressed. I, th I think it was about a year and a half ago, Pat, because we, we, we postponed it because of the upcoming beach season, and then we were going to revisit it over the winter, and then so. It might be almost two years ago now, and I forget specifically, but there were there were signage for skateboarding and loitering, and um, I think the dog walking, smoke. There were there were several things. It was, it was basically policy changes that the right. recreation department was going to make regarding the beaches. I'll go back to that. I I, I know that the smoking issue has been addressed in signage and if enforcement has occurred, and I, I think we had a good season of that last year. Dogs were again. We were waiting for the pet. Uh, waste bylaw, which now is in place, so we can discuss that. Okay. Um, and uh, 
it probably will go through a group of public hearings, and if you don't want it through this format, I'll discuss it with Peter and Bill, and we'll do whatever uh, hearings before we come to you or hearings as a part of your meeting, whichever is more convenient. Yeah, I, th I think Tracy's suggestion is a good one to have the recommendation take a look at it first and then bring it to the to the board. Yes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next, water payment in lieu of taxes, the ever-popular pilot discussion. How are you, Ed? Good, thanks. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to present this topic. Sure. Um, what we are going to discuss today are the final items in terms of uh, revenues that we might be able to apply against the budget to help close the budget gap and help us try to fund capital and other things that you want to take from free cash and put them into the regular budget. So this is one of the ideas to try to deal with that and once we have an answer to this particular item we can start to formulate the budget <clears throat> uh, to put in context where we are as uh, Bill Hinchy has done many times before um, we will realize some revenue from the increase uh, in proposition two and a half uh, and the new growth from a uh, building within the community um, those dollars are going to be consumed for the most part or over what will be raised through proposition two and a half by the uh, DY regional school district if um, they take the full two and a half percent and uh, the Cape Tech uh, school uh, district if they take the full uh, two and a half percent we also have uh, the budget busters that we've uh, discussed or Bill has discussed many times over the uh, last few years and that leaves us with an operating deficit of approximately eighty thousand dollars and that doesn't include the capital that we have to fund that uh, we lost some dollars as it relates to that capital in the last budget cycle. And, and excuse me, can you go back to that for a second? Certainly. Um, that, that also does not include um, other, uh, the new growth, is that simply in the uh, tax base? That's, 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 that's correct. Tax, tax base. So, 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 so the analysis does not include any growth in uh, other revenues that might occur. So we, we've been looking at compartmentalizing revenues. So Bill, um, in the last presentation, as we looked at revenues, uh, tried to look at the uh, local receipts and indicated that those could be uh, dollars that would fund any pay increases that would be negotiated with the unions. Mm -hmm. So that was the uh, $338,000 that Bill uh, referenced in there were, you know, Every 1% is about $190,000 in, in, uh, in expenses to the town. Okay, every 1% of COLA? Uh, of COLA, yes. Of COLA, okay. Yes. And, and in the budget busters, are there, are there uh, salary increases, salary and wage increases already included in the budget busters? Just the step increases. Just the step increases, so we've got kind of a, okay. And, and those are, are already part of our negotiations, already part of our, our salary tables. Um, so the right. COLAs are the ones that are still p to be negotiated. Okay. Uh, as Bill described uh, in previous meetings, uh, we're gonna be looking at economies, trying to reduce costs um, to try to get to where we need to be from a budget standpoint. Uh, you have already allowed us to raise fees to approach the cost of delivering certain services and we are going to explore other revenue opportunities and this is one of the last revenue opportunities we want to discuss with you before we set the budget or or propose a budget that uh, you will review and the FinCom will review um, just to kind of give uh, some perspective uh, the water commissioners um, have had done a great job in establishing uh, the water department for the town of Yarmouth they acquired uh, land they uh, built the water infrastructure uh, they set rates that allowed the community to operate uh, the organization as well as fund capital um, and there have been no rate increases in 19 years and the town of Yarmouth has uh, one of the lowest unsubsidized uh, water rates in on the Cape uh, just to give you a brief um, look at the financials uh, the water revenues are shown here in the expenses and that gives approximately $178,000 in net income 
from the water department. Um, we also have about $400,000 in uh, retained earnings, and we have $3.3 .3 million in capital in the water department. Can I ask a question? Certainly. About the department expenses. What's encapsulated in that 3.696 number? Is it salaries? Is it is it OPAB? Is it is it what's in that? Um, uh, many line items, but yes, salaries, OPEB, all of the Medicare -term expenses. Um, well, uh, in the pension uh, costs for the uh, water department retirees. It's and, included and, in that. Yes, it is. Okay. Debt does it include debt? Uh, no debt. Water department doesn't have any debt. Sure, you know, chemicals, um, you know, all of the uh, items that... I just want to make sure that all of it's in there, whereas some of our other uh, departments, the uh, long-term liabilities are separate. Well, uh, when I when I, I, I want to rephrase, though, for OPEB, we haven't fully funded or looked or uh, incorporated all of the obligations of the Water Department. So uh, their obligations would be about $114,000 uh, per year uh, to fully fund their uh, portion of the OPEB, and we're uh, looking at, from an expense standpoint, $50,000 for FY16. Okay, why, why aren't we fully funding it if they're able to do it? Just out of curiosity, we're trying to reach that goal. I'm just wondering if this is like the I, one department where we have the ability to um, reach it. Clearly, it's affordable. Right, we, we haven't um, increased or, or allocated the OPEB entirely to any of the departments so we're looking to try to ease them up to that level over time and not kind of hit them all at once um, so you know we just didn't uh, fully fund the OPEB uh, from them or water or, I'm sorry or golf or some of the other departments we haven't done that yet but we, we can look at that I guess I would just add briefly the we are more aggressive in funding 50% of the liability for OPEB for the water enterprise than we are with the general fund or with others. Um, true, it's not 100%. What you're about to hear in Ed's presentation is we don't have plenty of money because that 178 left over is insufficient to cover ongoing capital needs. So that's the reason, it, you know, if, if, we, if we had our capital fully funded and we had a surplus left over, we would certainly be looking at fully funding OPEB. But we're not quite there, and, and I'll let Ed continue with that presentation. And we can come back to that point, uh, if you like, as well. Uh, when we look at the assessed values of the water properties, and this is looking at the pilot aspect of, of water, um, they own approximately $37 million in both uh, land and buildings um, that are not being taxed or no taxes allocated uh, against those uh, properties. Uh, if they were fully taxed, that would be approximately $378,000. Uh, we are just presenting for your consideration as a part of trying to manage this cycle's budget, um, the potential of taking $175,000 for a pilot. So the, um, this is because we're using an enterprise fund which has its own revenue source. We can that, take from that revenue source and be in compliance with DOR. That, that's correct. DOR has ruled that this is appropriate. It's being done for other water departments, golf courses, uh, other entities. Our, our attorney has indicated that this is legal and most recently, uh, last evening, um, the um, attorneys for the school department has also have also indicated that uh, a pilot is uh, legal uh, if it's negotiated between two parties and that would be the water commissioners who are also the board of selectmen with the board of selectmen so you guys will have the opportunity talk to each other yes uh, so essentially what you're saying here is if we adopt a pilot program for FY16 we're taking the 175,000 out of the enterprise fund and putting it in the general fund that's correct, okay, and would, and that would well, it doesn't have to be the general fund. No, but that uh, would, well, we wouldn't have to agree to the 175 either. No, absolutely, no. Well, I'm just going by the numbers. Yeah, yeah, whatever you think is appropriate. That, uh, that was, if I could interrupt, that was going to be my question. Yeah. If we've got a if we've got a deficit of 80, and why would we take 175? Well, you're also looking at trying to bring in uh, roadside uh, tree trimming into the budget, as opposed to into so there are other you know, things that we grants. would do with the delta that would. That this would cover absolutely you're, you're looking at the pack unit you're looking at fire and police training <clears throat> those are in free cash grants and I think 
you've made uh, some indications that you might want to have that as part of the uh, formal budget as opposed to free crash grants. Okay. Well, I get the street sweeping too, huh? Right. <laughs> Uh, we also wanted to not just take um, a one-year view of this uh, particular issue. We wanted to give you what the long-term long perspective was as well, as, as Peter indicated. Uh, water needs approximately a million dollars a year in capital to maintain the availability and quarter, uh, quality of our water supply. Um, as we indicated, the Water Department has about $3.3 million in uh, capital reserves, and that gives us about three years' worth of capital spending. Um, the current net income with or without the pilot is insufficient in order to, for us to meet our capital obligations. Again, the water commissioners did a great job. They put us on a 19-year um, um, cycle of being able to fund capital, being able to fund operations, but that is coming to a close with some of the expenditures that we've made. Um, and I think as a part of this process, we need to uh, at some point review what are the lowest um, 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 the rates for water on the Cape. And I just want to give you some examples of what that looks like. Um, Yarmouth um, at $235 per 90,000 gallons is the lowest um, priced water supply on the Cape. And we have some amount of room with most of the different towns on the Cape. Again, um, I think the the folks that you know set up the water department and funded the capital and put in the infrastructure did a great job but we're just coming to a point where we need to probably make some decisions about what we want to do with our water rates going forward we could still do about 20 25 percent still be the lowest on the cape and then you know allow us to fund the capital keep the pilot in the in the budget and um, you know uh, continue on operating a, a fine water department Uh, so is it you're telling us that at the 235 we can't afford the pilot? At the 235 you can't afford the pilot. It just would be that you would not be able to uh, continue funding your capital in the next three years after the three-year uh, cycle of, of capital that's been put into the bank. My, my concern is, is that the 235 gives us an area to go if we have to start doing something um, with our unresolved wastewater uh, so we have a built-in protection because we have the lowest rate so that right. we could potentially afford contribution on that rate if we had to do something and uh, we've been moving a lot of fees up uh, I don't sit here thinking that's easy to do and it is a form of taxation one way or another so yeah. I'm less inclined to move the water than I am some of the other things that we've done because I really do think that's where we're going to have to go I, when we start dealing with wastewater. Yeah, I, I think with or without wastewater, you still need, if, you, if, if we want to continue to maintain our water system, we're going to need a million dollars in capital. So yeah, given we've got 3.3 .3 right now. So that's three years' worth of capital. So we're not talking about increasing the water rates today or, or next year. What we're doing is giving you a look forward, letting you know that we will eventually be coming to you and, and talking about the fact that we do not have enough money in, in a three-year time frame or after a three-year time frame after we've done the million dollars and brought or drawn down the $3.3 million, we probably need a water increase or water rate increase in order to allow us to fund uh, the continued capital uh, exp expenditures for the water s system. But no, we're not asking for a rate increase today or even next year. How much is the water department spending in capital per year currently above and beyond what we include in our capital, in, a, in the town's overall capital plan? Yeah. They have their own separate uh, capital plan. And is that a million dollars a year? That's approximately a million, million two. So, for example, just get, to give you a feeling for the capital expenditures, in order to uh, repaint um, a water tank, which is done every 10 years, that's about a million dollars. Um, and we have three tanks. So we rotate those, that painting, <coughs> the painting of those tanks. Tracy? I mean, I understand the purpose of what we're trying to achieve here, but um, you know, at the time that this was originally presented, I think that, uh, you know, 
I thought it was basically, you know, we were trying to overt the Department of Revenue from, yeah, yeah to get the enterprise money. But to even now hear that uh, we don't have enough money to in there to even do what we need to do and we're going to have to look at raising rates really um, makes me think that we, we're thinking very short term here um, in solving our budget problem for one year because it's not going to help us in the long run. We're taking money from where they need it um, and we're going to have to raise rates eventually. Again, you'll, you'll have to raise rates with or without our taking a pilot. It's just you wouldn't have to raise them as much, which would be the point, but you still, you still have a delta of over $800,000 per year after the three-year period. I understand. So you're, you're saying, based on the water revenues being 3875000 that uh, we're facing at least a 20% increase in water rates uh, in order to fund capital. That's correct. It, it, you know, I'm having a li little bit, you know, of, of trouble absorbing the numbers being that high when we're talking about operating expenses of three million seven. I'm having trouble with a million dollars of capital every year. Um, that just, that you know, it may well be right, uh, but you know, it's certainly before accepting all of those numbers, would would certainly want to look at. You know what is what is behind that? We, we have a 10-year capital plan, mm -hmm. or the water department has put together a 10-year capital plan. Again, staggering out the painting of water tanks, um, the replacement of undersized mains, um, those types of things. Uh, you know, improving the distribution, flushing out certain wells in order to ensure that they're functioning properly. So that plan has been laid out over a 10-year period, um, so that we could actually analyze um, when we looked at the the one million dollars per year uh, to try to you know have some meat behind those numbers and we can we can definitely give you that information so that you can take a look at it again that that's not an issue you know when we look at the water rates and you know I don't know when you we want to bring it before you but two or three years from now we we can we can bring that to you or we can bring that to you now uh, so that you can actually see the detail behind what uh, makes up the capital expenditures I, I just you yeah, I, I, you know, I guess before we uh, entertained any change in, uh, in the conceptual approach, I, I think in terms of pilot or anything else, I, I guess you know, I'd want to see some history uh, of what the capital expenditures have been historically over the last 10 years and then moving forward and, and try to get some comfort with regard to the numbers uh, and to the size of the numbers that you're talking about right. um, and uh, understand the capital plan looking forward uh, you're, you're indicating is about a million dollars a year uh, I'd also like to look backwards some just to get an idea of okay well where have we been and how much how much of the capital reserve have we, have we used each year what was the what did it build up to that sort of analysis yeah, I think uh, what the water department had been doing is taking retained earnings and putting it, you know, in the banks, so to speak, for capital, and got, has gotten it up to three point three million dollars. What we're going to be doing over the next three years is actually spending that capital as opposed to asking for for additional capital contributions. Uh, but you know, some of the things we've done in the past, obviously, are the automatic meter reading, which will actually help us to mitigate the labor required to actually go from house to house to read meters and actually reallocate that staff to maintenance as opposed to meter reading. So those are some of the large capital expenditures that we've done over the previous years that we don't have to redo again. So you know, I think you'll see some spikes in the last several years related to actually implementing that technology to help mitigate future costs. Uh, but yes, we can we can definitely give you the history of the of the capital. But just to, to give you, you know, a perspective again, if if a tank costs you know, over a million dollars to paint, and we are just spinning off $178,000 in revenue, you know, just, you know, from, uh, you know, with, you know, a back of the napkin calculation, we don't have enough money, you know, but then when we add in all of the other factors, you know, that, you know, um, you know, causes us to, to take a look at, you know, what we might need to do in the next, you know, two to three years in terms of rates. How many years into that capital plan are you? Do you know? No, we have a 10-year forward capital plan from now yes okay. 
Is this is this a reflection of the fact that we're not putting in as many new services and now we're maintaining the system so the cost of maintenance of the existing system is greater than the revenue we used to get from the expansion paid for by the property owners? It, it, uh, that's correct. We used to get more in service connection fees. Yeah. But in addition, people are also conserving. So um, folks are not using as much so water the as they have water in the past. Is not the same too? Okay. Uh, if I could just chime in on that, uh, you know, the there's this thing called inflation. You know, the cost of of uh, labor, the cost of materials, and the and that's both operating and capital has been going up for 19 years, and the rates have stayed flat. So that's the biggest piece I think that we're talking about in terms of why we need an increase now, and we didn't need it in the past. I think Jim's spot on though with when when we did look at wastewater and not that we we want to go back there and address it but that was the one uh, portion that we knew that we had some some room should you know the situation uh, you know if an opportunity comes where or not an opportunity but we're forced to do something in a certain way I think that that is where we were looking um, to be able yeah. to make uh, that, that affordable. That's a great point, and you know uh, the board can decide to go forward with this or not. We were looking to identify as many revenue opportunities as we could to address the goals um, that had been identified. Uh, I just want to, you know, provide a you know a quick sort of measure of what we're talking about. If we are looking pilot aside, if we are looking at a twenty percent increase just to maintain. Uh, just to maintain our capital and our operating expenditures, that takes us to about $285 on the rate. We're still among the lowest on the Cape. So it still leaves us, you know, the high is 660 and the, you know, in the middle is in the yep. 400s. But the reason you got the 660 at Provincetown is they have a wastewater treatment system that we don't have. Right. So I'm just saying even, you know, even after the 20 percent increase, you know, you're still at the bottom. You're still at 285. You could double it, you know, not that anyone wants to double it, but if you're talking about wastewater and you're talking about real money, you could double it and get to 565, and then you'd be in the area where Falmouth and Wellfleet are, and they're, you know, and they have uh, wastewater systems. So your, your, your point is excellent, and this pilot is a, a relatively small piece of the entire, you know, water department carrying cost. Um, and but you, you know you're absolutely right. It's it's 175,000. If you want to squirrel that away so that it's there for wastewater and and not use it as a pilot, then you know that's a consideration for you. Mike, do you have anything? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I I agree with Norm that that before I would um, get serious about something like this, I'd want to see what the history was on the capital what the range of fluctuation would be on capital expenses from year to year and get kind of a profile of, of how this three plus million dollars was accumulated. Um, secondly, I'm not a big believer in this conceptually. I'll, I'll have to admit that with one um, department in effect um, having their assets assessed and then have a pilot based on it seems very artificial and very mechanical. If this was football, they would call that an end run. That would be the play. Um, but be that as it may, there may be critically important issues that would warrant using this device to fund other things outside of the department. And the, the, as Jim said, I think that that really uh, critical issue would probably be wastewater. Um, that's a problem that's, that's been here a long time. There's no immediate solution, and it's not going to go away. It's inevitable that the community at large, and by that I mean the Cape community, is going to have to address it. So in the absence of, of seeing what the history is on the Capitol, and bearing in mind what I said about that critical water quality issue that is going to crop up sooner than later, I'd rather not see that $175,000 siphoned off of the water receipts at this point in time. Uh, other, is there any capital included in expenses at all? No. No. Um, so just so that I can make sure I, I understand very clearly, if we round up 178 to 200000 sure. and we and we average out 
yearly capital needs at a million. That means the enterprise fund has been subsidizing capital to the tune of about 800000 per year, which means that if we stay flat, it's going to be gone in four years. With, if we were to increase water rates 20% today, how, lo how long would it then take to deplete the enterprise fund? Is that something you can easily well, figure th out? That would just be a matter of inflation at that point in time because, you know, if what we're saying is we need about a million dollars in capital. Mm -hmm. That 20% would give us that uh, approximately million dollars in capital. Uh, that just being eaten away from inflation would, would take us out. So that would get us on a similar glide path to, to the commission, what the commissioners did about 19 years ago. Well, I think the sentiment is that, you know, charging this pilot is going to push us to a position where we have to increase the rates even more rapidly than we than we would have to otherwise. I mean, I, I simply don't think the department can afford it. And and to that, I will add that this seems to be this seems to be something that Yarmouth does is, you know, in order to keep the cost to the taxpayer down, we go years and years and years without increases, and I keep coming back to the marina, to the slip mm -hmm. fees, and how crazy people went over, they went over that what they viewed as a, as a doubling or tripling of slip fees, but this is what we have done in, in, through, through history, is we, we, we've tried to keep fees down, and in 10 years, we've ended up shooting ourselves in the foot because in order to pay for expenses, we have to make dramatic increases rather than making incremental small increases. And we don't make up for the loss that we had in the 10 years we didn't do we anything. We never do because we've yeah. lost 10 years of revenue from those in that we would have otherwise had had those incremental smaller increases been yeah. put in. So the, the other concern I have with this discussion, though, is is that we have to be serious, it seems to me, about the pilot program if we're going to ask others to be serious about it. So whether we ever do it or don't do it, I don't think it's a, a comfortable position to say to the school, you got to do it, but we're not going to do it. Well, I think my, I, I agree with that, but I think my biggest part is we're penalizing basically somebody who's runs a profitable, so, so we're doing it for one because they can afford it, and yet the golf can't. Maybe one's run better than the other, but you know, I mean, it's not. It's if we're going to charge it, and we're really saying that it's costing us money, and then we should charge it, whether they can afford it or not. Well, what we're doing, what we're doing is, we're as Mike said, doing an end round or end, uh, around DOR regulations. We have the ability to do this in a way. It's it's legal to do it, but it's it's a modification of the process in order to do it. And we so, have to remember that the townspeople put it in an enterprise fund so that that type of thing wouldn't happen. Well, I understand that, uh, you know, we've got different different situations uh, when you look at the water department versus the uh, golf department versus the school system. In in each of those, they're, they're a unique, uh, there's a unique impact as a result of a rate increase. In the case of the water department, uh, do we have any private wells in town? Yes, we do. We do? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I guess, I don't know very what per percentage. Very small right. percentage. Yeah. So, so for the most part, I mean, you know, it, it, any rate increase is essentially a tax increase for all, all of the uh, residents of town. Uh, a rate increase, however, in the golf department affects a Excuse very me. small number of people. Uh, uh, you know, I count myself as one of those, but nonetheless, I think what's right is right in terms of fairness. Uh, a, a rate increase uh, effectively with the school department also affects another town and, uh, and benefits uh, the taxpayers in our town. So there's, there's differences in the impact of each one. Yeah, and I think, I think that we need to look at that and, and think about those differences logically. Uh, I don't think we should just say, well, we're not going to do it, period. I think we have to think about the, the, uh, the, the approach and, and the impact that it has on all of the users right. and the taxpayers. And, and all we're doing when we come before you with a lot of, or with these uh, concepts, is to try to give you some information that you might use to, as Bill indicates, uh, 
stick with your number one goal, which is not to increase the tax rate, and but give you some options of other ways that you can actually fund yeah, some of the things that you've indicated you want back in the budget that were not allowed to be in the budget because of you know poor economic times. They, those things were stripped out of the budget. And so, well, you're absolutely right. That hundred seventy-five thousand dollars would help our budget uh, immensely, right? So I mean, you know, it would be easy for us to sit here and say, but. You know, I think we have, I appreciate the creativity. I think that what you guys have brought forth for these types of discussions is, is really important. I think we all have a better understanding of of uh, the enterprise fund and, and where we're at. But, um, you know, yeah, I realize that our decision essentially is putting our budget in a deficit of $175,000 by saying that. But I just think it's a very short-term um, solution to a long-term problem. Well, the other issue, I think, and I think, Tracy, you brought it up, we could do this this year without an impact, but we can't do it long term without an impact on our water rates. That's correct. It, it, again, your water rates are going to be impacted no matter what you do. Yeah, exactly. So I would have a very difficult time looking our taxpayers straight in the eye and, and, and uh, in a presentation in which we had enacted a $175,000 pilot program and and then are saying well we've got to increase water rates because we have got to pay ourselves <laughs> that's right i mean it it just uh yeah, i don't think it it passes a sniff test to very very frankly at this stage i and i'd go back to what uh was saying earlier i think we need a a because of what you put out on the table here there's a lot of things that you've talked about the capital needs and so forth so i think that we need a a broader look at the water department in terms of uh, the rate structure and the analysis of the expenses and so forth before we make a decision on, at least from my perspective, before we make a decision on a pilot program. Yeah, and, and we can bring that to you very quickly yeah. if, if you like. But, you know, I think it's also a matter of is this, before we do that work, is this a concept that you are willing to entertain or, as you indicated, is this, you know, um, you know, not following your your concept of not applying a tax? You know, so philosophically, is this something that you want to do in order to help try to close the budget gaps, or do you want to look to other mechanisms to close the budget gap before we actually? I, I think in this case, we really do want this other information before we say yes or no, because that information is going to affect whether I say yes or no. So I, I don't okay. think it's going to be wasted time okay. to let us know what the what the yeah. capital expenses have been and how they've been allocated and so forth because we 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 know at some point if we've only got the three point three that we're going to have to do something but I'd like to be able to. So, so but is this a, is this a discussion for this year or I think a, you, as we get no, I you think closer to having a rate increase is that a discussion for that time period? Uh, yeah, could I, could I could I just test that for a second? Because um, you know, on the one hand, I'm I'm hearing that you know it sounds like philosophically several, if not most, or all of you have a discomfort with the concept. Um, now, if if the particulars, it, it, you know, if there is if there is some factual information, some data that is really going to move you one way or the other, as as Ed said, we're absolutely happy to provide it. You know, I can tell you pretty much because I've been you know I've been reviewing the capital plans for the last 14 years, you know, we've been spending, you know, at minimum 900000 I should say, let me clarify that, we have been authorizing $900,000 in water capital expend expenditures per year, 900 to 2 million per year. It's averaging probably about 1.2, as Ed said. So in terms of that history, you know, that's that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. And at that pace, we have grown a balance. The, we've been authorizing the capital spending faster than we've been spending it. So we've grown a balance of unexpended authorizations of 3.3 of million. And it wasn't zero 14 years ago and now 3.3. But over the long haul, we've, you know, we've reached a 3.3 million. So I, you know, I think with inflation, we can safely say we need to spend at least a million dollars a year and now there's a there's a deeper dive that that Norm has referenced in terms of okay what's the what what is the total value of our assets and how does our annual spending compare to the total value of the assets 
it isn't capital intensive as compared to most other industries, certainly. So I think if you look at capital spending relative to operating, it might seem like a really high ratio. But I guess I'm not certain what data we could possibly bring forward that's going to that's going to make you all say, yeah, we're ready to support this pilot. Well, I guess my thinking is, and I don't want to speak for everybody else's, this is one element of capital spending. Just because they have their own money, we have to be responsible for the entire town's worth of capital expenses. And I think we need to know how you're spending it and what you're spending to know what we're going to be doing in the future with this. We know there's a change that's going to come at some point, but to have information in advance so that we can see these pieces as individual pieces and then as the whole. I mean, we're getting certainly a lot more information on the budget in the last several years, but we have gaps in that information sure. that would be helpful to have. I, I guess maybe to frame it differently uh, from what Peter said, is this to help you prepare for the rate increase discussion yes. or is this to help oh, you yeah. finalize your decision as it relates to pilot? Well, well, I, I think our time is better served preparing people for the eventual <laughs> rate increases yeah. and, 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 and gathering the data to, to justify it. Yeah, for me, because um, uh, this, the pilot expense would translate into a rate increase, mm -hmm. essentially, that affects all of the taxpayers in the town, I'm less excited or, or, or enthused, I shouldn't say excited, <laughs> enthused about uh, this, this particular pilot proposal than it might be with regard to um, the, uh, the golf department or to the school system because, again, there are a lot of other players that are impacted as a result of those decisions. So 16,000 parcels have water, 18,000 parcels are within the town. So, right. yes, a vast majority yeah. of the parcels in, in, uh, um, hmm. within Yarmouth are, are, have water. Yeah. Yes. And, and so, you know, we're, we're just trading dollars and <laughs> Essentially, in terms of yeah. uh, tax increase exactly versus there, right? uh, water increase, I, I don't know. Is that, <laughs> I just, you know, is that worth getting into a big argument over with our, our, our townspeople in terms of, okay, here's what's happening with, yeah. with the water but, department? But, but I, I, but I also right. want to just say that the pilot is not driving the rate Understand. decision as it relates to capital. But it, capital. But it would be an element in that. It's, it's it would gonna, be a, it would be a two, it would be a 17 percent element. Rate. I prefer the information in terms of the whole picture as Jim said the capital I'd like to see where the money is I'd like to think long term but in terms of helping for my decision and the pilot it's not necessary. Well and it, it goes back to difference. what Eric said too is that if we're going to do a rate change we don't want to do one every year if we don't have to because we're trying to catch up we want to be realistic and forecast for everybody what those changes are going to be in order for us to fund the capital for the next 10 years right. and that would be encompassed in a rate study right. and yeah. we also because of the new technology that the water department has put in place with the automatic meter reading system we can also provide a little bit better service to our customers where we can actually bill consumption each quarter instead of billing them $21 and then a huge bill once a year. So, you know, that's in, in that means that the, the, the steps for the water uh, rates, those have to be re-examined because we're billing on a quarterly basis as opposed to an annual basis. So we have to do a rate study which will encompass both the operations and capital. So that would be, you know, a much more extensive um, type of process. It's uh, easy to process. collect on a quarterly basis a little bit than it is in July to get the whole bunch when People have yeah. overused for the whole year too. Yeah. Absolutely, we you know there we put out financial questionnaires to people as we we use the same process we did for the ta tax title. Somebody comes in, they're going to get their water shut off. We do some financial questionnaires for them, see if they can afford you know the full amount. If they can't, we put them on payment plans. So we understand that yet yeah, you know getting hit with one bill is is not necessarily friendly to our customers, but the water department will be addressing that. So. That will all be part of an overall rate study, which will include capital, which will include operations. Yes, Peter. So I, I uh, clearly you want a lot more information, and, and we would intend to provide you a lot more information before bringing a rate increase forward. Um, but I, while we're on the subject, 
am I hearing that you would like for us to do that sooner rather than later? Because you know we might have we might have put that two to three years down the the, the road, um, but we could certainly bring that forward sooner if you'd like. I think, yeah. I think we need it sooner. Yes. Yeah, I think, yeah. think we need it sooner, but okay. I don't think yeah. it should be. Um, personally, I don't think it should be part of. A pilot thing it should be a whole another discussion so two with two pieces we yeah. you know so on the on the rates we hear you loud and clear let's let's have a, a full analysis of it um, and let's move forward sooner rather than later yeah. on the pilot sounds like no appetite am I correct I, so. no, I, I have no appetite till I see those numbers anyway because I want to see right. what that change means before I Go along with a pilot. I don't, I don't think the numbers are going to make any sense. So. No, you I, could do I it. Mean, no, no I don't, I, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If if we've got to make a substantial rate increase, I don't want to do that and the pilot program. Right. Period. Right. That's if that's. Okay, so you know what what I think that may lead to is uh, no pilot for FY16 because it's probably going to be a year or so to to pull together a real rate study. Sure. Uh, and <coughs> at that time, when we are looking at the water rates again, we might revisit. The pilot concept. Mm -hmm. Mike? I just wanted to say that um, <clears throat> I have a real problem, as Norman suggests, selling this to voters. Um, it, it sure smells like a tax to me. It, it is different. <laughs> it is different than these other um, fees that impact only a segment of the population. This is pretty much a universal yeah. user fee, if you want. And I call a universal user fee and a tax brothers. Um, so, you know, in terms of siphoning off $175,000 for present budget purposes um, is one thing, but really I think it's disingenuous in terms of um, not being in keeping with the um, basic principles of, of democracy at our town meeting. and, and um, um, I think as Tracy suggested, just because you have a successful um, program doesn't mean that should be undone or tampered with. You know, that, that, that kind of brings me back to the old adage that no deed goes unpunished. I mean, the water department is doing a good job, and um, I'm, I'm not saying I would be in all circumstances against having some of that revenue being applied to critical situations such as water quality. But it would have to be pretty compelling for me to um, do it by way of a pilot. And I, I just wanted to make uh, one comment about uh, the end run for the DOR. The DOR has indicated that up to 15 percent of the um, enterprise funds coming to the general fund is acceptable, and we're at 8.9 percent. Oh, I, I'm overhead not calculation. I, I so, didn't mean to suggest yeah. we were doing something that yeah. was incorrect. So even yeah. even adding Approvable. even adding this would not even get us to that 15 percent right. level. But, and, you know, our board makes the decision on fees with public comment. Sure. Um, whereas tax increases are voted on by the voters, on the taxpayers. Right. And I think that the, there's a difference there, and I think a level of responsibility and and of uh, care. Uh, uh, prudent care that we need to take in, in this rate setting process. Yeah, and obviously, we're not trying to circumvent the voters in any way, just trying to give you guys options because you're now going to get into the difficult part of saying, okay, these are the revenues that we have in order to right. actually fund different priorities, and this is going to kind of reduce your flexibility in terms of some of the things that you might want to incorporate in the budget. But, you know. Right. You guys don't have an easy job, so. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to cast any aspersions to that effect, but I'm just trying to point out the, the political reality of, sure. of doing something like Absolutely. this. Absolutely. No, and if there was uh, $175,000 worth of general fund uh, water-related items that we could move into there to free up, I think that that would be a completely different story. Sure. Do you have the direction you need, Peter? Ed? We certainly do. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. All right, Mr. Quirk, I didn't see any uh, board no. of committee actions. Next, next meeting we will have a bunch. Okay. Uh, Mike, any individual items? Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things quickly. Um, I had received an e email a couple of days ago about the success of JetBlue. Um, they are coming back next summer. There's going to be a slight ex extension in terms of the schedule, at least the beginning dates. 
And that, that was in the paper today. I think they're going to start maybe either nine days earlier than they did last year, but they had a very successful season. The, um, the other thing I wanted to um, um, bring up is that um, I had a number of people um, call me and, and, and talk to me uh, in public about the meeting at the fire station saying they couldn't hear anything and that, uh, excuse me, the police station, and that, um, yes, <laughs> but they said it sounded like it wasn't, and, well, particularly for people that spoke from the audience, I think that was a big issue. And they said it was like really garbled and they got really frustrated with it and stopped watching it, and I guess, I, the, the, I, I know that the, um, Hook up there isn't as good as it is here, but one of the questions I had is: Is this something that could be um, improved upon? Have, has anybody looked at that and trying to um, upgrade that equipment? Or we have this consistent complaint every single time we're there, which is once every year and a half, probably. Yeah. Well, it's probably good reason um, until the system has improved to avoid having meetings there because the public feels like they've been disenfranchised. Well, so, um, yeah. so we cancel uh, it was meeting. the lesser of the evils. We could have had a meeting on Veterans Day. Would that have been better? Well, we don't necessarily always have to have them on Tuesday. We could have them no. on a different no. day. Okay. Then we'll have to put out an emergency alert notification. Anyway, in my view, it was the lesser of the two evils. Well, the, I, th I, think it, I think if we have advance notice, um, and I'm not implying any, any, any fault in that, Eric. I, I think uh, if we knew a year in advance that it was likely that we are going to have to schedule something, or, or even six months in advance that we were going to have to uh, schedule something uh, at uh, the police station, then, then I think looking at alternatives, another day of the week or some other, uh, trying to do something else uh, might be uh, a better approach given the, the difficulty with with hearing and uh, what, are, what is going on. We can certainly take a look at improving the audio there. It, it has been a source of uh, complaints when the few times that we've used it. Uh, it's not necessarily cheap to improve upon it, but we do get some cable funding for that. Uh, so we can certainly take a look at that. The, you know, the, um, the other issue that we sometimes come across when we try to change the day of the week is we have conflicts for this room. Yeah. Uh, but we'll we'll take a look at the uh, at the capital investment and see if we can improve the technology. So along those lines, I guess what some people may have missed is the discussion about naming the um, Route 6A playground after Fred Thatcher. Um, that there was an article in the Register um, last week that was very very good, um, and I won't go into that discussion or repeat what was discussed. I just invite people to take a look at last week's register article if they missed the um, discussion on that thank you Tracy um, well I want to thank the AMVETS for their Veterans Day uh, ceremony that they do between uh, the bridges uh, between Dennis and Yarmouth every year it's uh, it's always a nice ceremony um, last Friday I attended the Cape Island Selectmen and Counselors meeting and Sarah Peak and um, Mr. Sumner from Brewster spoke in reference to the expanded uh, rooms tax to include um, hotels and rentals. And I'm not sure where we were at. I know um, when Suzanne was on the board, she was um, pushing that along. I don't know if we had taken it to a vote, um, but if we have taken it to a vote, I know it needs to be reauthorized after 18 months, and they are trying to act on it. Um, you know, So they're compiling uh, everything now, and, and Sarah Peak has been um, trying to advocate for the Cape delegation, uh, the expanded tax. And I don't know what that means in terms of money or if the board uh, wants to have a, another discussion about it to see where we go from here. But um, certainly it's something that if, uh, if the home rule, if we can get a home rule petition. Uh, We're talking about a, 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 the tax being applied to rentals of uh, individual homes. Yes. Is it, does it include different tax rates for primary residences and secondary? Well, it's not primary residence long term. It's not. This is just for transient. 
they talked a lot about Airbnb now being a very um, popular place where people are renting rooms. It's a very short-term, very transient um, website that a lot of people are using, so it's much easier to track now in terms of the D Department of Revenue. Um, but they are um, aggressively for some of the towns uh, trying to achieve the home rule petition for that. And I know we had talked about it some years back, and I honestly could not remember where we left it. We did bring it to town meeting twice. It was approved by town meeting twice, but it has been over 18 months, so if they're filing legislation again, we would need to file it again. Okay. So I just, in case that does pass, um, and we want our, ours to be um, in the mix, if it's something I think the board should uh, have an, another discussion about it and, and maybe bring it back to town meeting. We put that on a future agenda, Peter. We'll do. We'll add it to the list of potential warrant articles for you to review. Okay, Jim. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, to uh, say something about the the accident and the two uh, individuals who went to the aid of the uh, operator of the vehicle that hit the tree on six A. And I think it's it speaks well for this town and this country that people put themselves at risk to try to help other people. And I'm. I'm really, uh, you know, it's a scary situation. Most of us have never faced that, but to have them do that and then the fire department to come in and protect them as well as the individual that was in the vehicle while they put the fire out, I think is something to be commended. And I want to say so publicly for those two individuals. Or? Um, yeah, just briefly, I, I, uh, well, I was disappointed to see uh, the presentation uh, postponed on MCAS. I, I, was uh, doubtful that it could be accomplished in 15 minutes <laughs> uh, from the get-go. Um, I, I do hope uh, that I, I noticed I visited the website, the school committee website, and there's a um, listing of objectives uh, that includes MCAS uh, 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 improvement objectives that dates, covers the period from 2009 through 2014. And um, I'm interested specifically in, in how uh, those, how we're doing against those objectives. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important uh, for us to know that, you know, are we meeting the, the plans that we have laid out for ourselves? Uh, I'll take partial responsibility for that. I, uh, I was away last week with no access to email, so I wasn't able to have my weekly meeting with Bill and wasn't able to see the agenda until Monday. So I, I just thought it was in everybody's best interest if we gave it the time it deserved. So, Peter, I, right now I'll ask you if you could put it on, as a workshop meeting on either the 2nd or the 16th. Uh, I wouldn't put anything else significant with, us, with it because I, I suspect it will take an hour if their presentation is 45 and we have questions and answers it's it's an hour and 15 hour and a half meeting anyway so that actually works out really nicely for December 2nd because we really don't have anything else other than an executive session all right well you put that on there as a workshop for December 2nd we will do so, so uh, be on notice if you're listening that December 2nd we will be having the MCAS discussion with the school superintendent that we were intending to have tonight but Due to unforeseen circumstances, we weren't able to. So, um, Peter, uh, consent agenda? We do have a consent agenda. It has a waiver of fees for trailer for Taylor Bray Farm and some donations, totaling $304 for donations. The fee waivers amount to $70. Move the consent agenda. Is there a second? Any discussion? Oh, did somebody? <laughs> I got ahead of myself. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, updates, Peter? The only updates I had was uh, just to confirm our schedule. Uh, we had sent a note out about just moving the December 2nd meeting to December 9th. Norm indicated he has a conflict for December 9th. Uh, so Can we do. Can he call in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I haven't adopted He's not, He doesn't want to play the card. It must not be anything important on the agenda that night. <laughs> saving it. He's saving it. <laughs> yeah. We've got two. Yeah. You want to wave? Ba maybe. <laughs> All right. So we have, uh, at the moment, we have meetings scheduled for December 2nd and uh, December 16th. 16th. 
is open if we are not meeting on December 9th then we have December 16th open for a meeting okay that was that way that it was originally correct yeah right yes so right. we'll just keep it that way okay I know there was there was some scheduling efficiencies and moving it but you'll be able to work around that we will work around it okay anything else Peter no nothing else motion to adjourn so moved. second all those in favor Aye. Aye. <laughs> sure. especially for the adjournment you want another one of them, Norman? No. <laughs> <laughs>